So I am Nicola Hoggard Cregan, the co-director of New Zealand Christians and Science, and with us today also is the Reverend Dr. Chris Mulheron, the CEO of ISCAST, Dr. Sarah Wilson, the um, program director for ISCAST, and also Jackie Liu from ISCAST. And from New Zealand Christians and Science, we have um, Emma um, Belsha and Grace Cox as well. So welcome, everybody. We're so glad that you've come back tonight and that um, you're continuing this adventure in consciousness. Um, let me first of all um, introduce um, Neil and then I'll pray for us before we begin. Neil Dodgson is, is Professor of Computer Graphics and since 2019 Dean of the Faculty of Graduate Research at Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand. He has oversight of the 1500 research students across all the university's disciplines. He has an undergraduate degree in mathematics and physics and computer science from Massey University. He spent 27 years in Cambridge, England, first as a PhD student and then as a member of the academic staff, eventually becoming deputy head of the Department of Computer Science and Technology in 2010. He was a fellow of Emmanuel College, Cambridge from 1995 to 2016. And he's going to speak to us again about the deeper reaches of consciousness. So let me um, begin with a prayer. Loving God of all creation and all knowing and loving, guide us all tonight as we think about the deepest of all mysteries, the consciousness of ourselves and other creatures and even machines. Give us strength and encouragement and Strength to Neil as he presents for us and give us wisdom in our conversations and discussion. In the name of Christ, the one who, through whom all things are upheld and all things are healed. Amen. Thank you. Namihi nui ki a koto katoa. Warm greetings to you all from Chile, Aotearoa, New Zealand. Thank you for inviting me to talk. So tonight, can a computer be conscious? How would we tell? And what would it mean for humanity? There is no computer today that is conscious, yet there are 8 billion humans who we believe to be conscious. If the human brain is like a computer, then surely we should be able to build a computer that works like the human brain. So what is it that differentiates us humans from computers? Is it simply that we have not yet made a computer complicated enough to exhibit consciousness? Or is there something fundamental that means we never will? That's what we're going to explore over the next 30 minutes. Artificial intelligence has made massive strides in the past decade, and particularly in the past six months. We now have systems like ChatGPT that are doing things that we thought were beyond the capabilities of computers. ChatGPT is writing essays that would get reasonable grades if submitted by an undergraduate student. Dahl.e is creating artwork far faster than a trained graphic designer could. And Google's Lambda convinced Google engineer Blake Lemoine that it was sentient. After exchanging chat with Lambda, Blake Lemoine said, if I didn't know exactly what it was, which is this computer program we built recently, I'd think I was talking to a seven-year-old, eight-year-old kid that happened to know physics. There are other experts who are also convinced that machines are approaching consciousness. But many others are convinced that there is no evidence of sentience, and there's quite a lot of evidence against it. So today's large neural networks like Lambda and ChatGPT, they are producing impressive results. But what are they really doing? And is this a route to consciousness, or is this a blind alley? So let's go back a bit. Artificial intelligence has been around since the dawn of computing. In the 1950s, there was great hope for creating artificial intelligence quickly. The thinking was that if a human could do something, surely it would be easy to get a computer to do that same thing. Well, it turns out that people are rather more complicated than the computer scientists expected. For example, understanding natural spoken language is something that most children can do easily. So early on in computing, it was expected that speech recognition would be solved by the 1960s. It turns out to be stunningly difficult to get a computer to recognize speech. And it's only in the last 20 years that we have got computers to reliably do this, 50 years later than we expected to be able to do it. So in the early days of artificial intelligence, we hand-coded systems that were based on the way we thought that humans did high-level reasoning. So we were successful in getting computers to do some things that humans find difficult, like play chess. 
easy to get a computer to play chess because there are straightforward rules, clear guidelines for what constitute good and bad moves, and the computer can work through thousands of possibilities, far more than any human could. So computers have been able to beat humans at chess for decades, but they do it in quite a different way to how humans play. And the chess playing computer is just a box of tricks doing exactly what we've told it to do. You couldn't hold a conversation with a chess playing computer. Now today we are well beyond the point of getting computers to play abstract games. The reason artificial intelligence is so in the news now is because of the phenomenal recent advances. After decades of research, there was a big breakthrough about 15 years ago in how we do AI. And that technology is called deep learning. Now deep learning is a fancy term, but it's a simple concept. What we do is we build computer systems that mimic the way we think the human brain is constructed. That's with many layers of artificial neurons, each layer communicating to the next through a lot of connections. The deep in deep learning comes from the fact that the neural network is many layers deep. And the learning part comes because we train this neural network by feeding it an enormous amount of data. That is, we give it lots of different inputs, and for each input, we tell it what the correct output should be. So the system initially starts off by guessing, just completely randomly guessing at output, and then it tweaks its internal neurons and the connections based on the difference between what it actually output and what it was told is the correct output. So for example, we can give it an input as a photograph of an animal, and we tell it what animal that is. Is it a cat or a dog or a goat or a bear? When it guesses wrong, it does tiny internal adjustments to get a higher probability of being right if it sees something similar in the future. But if it gets it right, it also does tiny internal adjustments to strengthen the settings that got things right. So what it is is a prediction machine. It predicts the output based on its input and its training. And with enough training, you can get a deep neural network to then give the right answer to inputs that it has never seen before. So it's learned how to solve that particular problem. You do need a lot of training data to get this right. So in the case of training to spot animal species, you literally need millions of labeled images in the training set to get it to have good accuracy. Now, before I go any further, I just need to let you know that I'm going to be using that phrase prediction machine as a shorthand for the sort of behavior that we see from deep neural systems, the machines that predict what should happen based on what they've seen and what they've learned. Okay, so what does this prediction machine idea have to do with ChatGPT and the other systems that generate this devastatingly good text, such as the stuff that we saw last week in Chris's talk? These artificial intelligence systems are large, deep neural networks. They are prediction machines. They are trained on a phenomenal amount of input data gathered from across the internet, hundreds of billions of words of data. And their job is to predict what the next word will be given the context of the previous several thousand words. So they've seen several thousand words, they know what the previous several thousand words, and they're just predicting what's the next word, and then what's the word after that, and the word after that. And with good training, which they have, and a big enough context, which they've got, they can produce stunning results. For example, I got ChatGPT to write a 100 word marketing blurb for my university, and it produced something that could have come straight out of our human marketing department. After all, there is a lot of marketing copy in the training data. I asked it to write a biography of me. It wrote a beautifully crafted biography in exactly the right style, but it got over half the facts wrong. And that's because it knows what a biography looks like, but it's basically just grabbing random words that sound right. For example, it said that I'd worked at two universities that I've never even visited, and that my PhD is not a completely different topic to what I really did. But if you didn't know better, it would sound right. And that is essentially the problem with ChatGPT. It's trained to produce great sounding text, but it has no check whatsoever on whether it is writing the truth. So undergraduate students listening to this, beware. If you use ChatGPT to write your essay, you are going to have to go through it and check that all of the facts are right. OK, back to the question in hand in this series. Are these artificial intelligences conscious? And the answer is simple. 
No. These systems are just prediction machines, giving you the best guess of what comes next based on what they've seen before. So hooray for us humans. We are still different from machines. We humans are more than just prediction machines. Or are we? So what evidence do you have that humans are any different from this? What evidence do you have that the people around you are not just highly sophisticated prediction machines, saying and doing things that are their brain's best guess of the next thing to do based on everything that has gone before? And the answer to that is you don't know for sure. You only know what's going on in your own head. So if you take a reductionist view of consciousness, then that says that humans are truly just prediction machines. Every decision that's made in our brains is a result of deterministic natural processes. And therefore, because it's all deterministic, we are just big prediction machines. In this reductionist model of consciousness, there can be no free will. Now, you may have the illusion that you are freely making decisions, but you are not because everything's deterministic, it's all predetermined, and your so-called conscious mind is just going along for the ride. And what that means is I had no choice but to give this talk, and you, you have no choice but to listen. If this reductionist model of consciousness is correct, then the brain really is nothing more than a biological computer. Your consciousness is an il illusion, and there is no reason why a sufficiently complex digital computer could not develop consciousness to the same level as a human or higher. Okay, so let's move to a Christian view. As a Christians, we are really not comfortable with this reductionist view of consciousness, with us as just prediction machines. Our theology requires free will. Humans need to be freely able to choose. My understanding of the theology is that there's a God of love who wants beings who can freely choose whether or not to love. There's no point in having beings who are forced to love, for that is not love at all. Therefore, there must be a free choice and hence free will. So that's great. That's a really nice piece of theology. And the theologians listening can comment later on whether that's good theology. But scientifically, it's got a problem. Where does this free will reside? If the free will is in the physical structure of the brain, then we should be able to build a computer that has free will and consciousness. But if we reject the reductionist method and free will resides other than in the physical structure of the brain, then where is it? And could a computing machine have access to the non-physical whatever it is? Now, at this point, I do need to come clean. I'm not a philosopher and I'm not a theologian. So I'm bringing you the view of someone who knows a lot about computers, but has just a lay understanding of these other topics. Now, when preparing for this talk, I did a good real deal of reading. And what I found is that throughout my reading is that I have been confusing and confounding several different concepts in my head. And essentially, what we're dealing with when we talk about computers and thinking and intelligence and consciousness is confounding a whole bunch of different questions that get quite mixed up with each other. So the questions are what we started with. Can a computer be conscious? Can a computer be self-aware? Can a computer have free will? Can a computer be a moral agent? Can a computer reason? Can a computer think? They are not the same thing. They're just connected to each other. And I don't have time to explore all of those. And I'm grateful for the other speakers in this series who will explore some of these ideas in more detail. So what I want to talk about is how we would tell if a computer is conscious and what that would mean for what we believe in ourselves as humans. Now, I'm well aware that this is not an argument that's solely about computers versus humans. You also now get questions about whether the higher animals are conscious in the way that humans are. So higher animals includes apes, elephants, dolphins, and octopuses. So octopuses. Is an octopus intelligent? Does an octopus have free will? Does an octopus have consciousness? Now, we do know that octopuses are highly intelligent problem solvers. But is consciousness related to intelligence? Are octopuses self-aware? 
And if there is a consciousness in an octopus, how do we communicate with a consciousness that's so different from our own? What sort of mental life would an octopus have? And does any of this make it wrong to eat them? Well, we're not going to eat a computer, but the same questions do arise. How would you go out telling if a computer is conscious? The standard response, as Chris alluded to last week, is that we should use the Turing test. And that was designed by Alan Turing, one of the pioneers of computer science, as a test of whether a machine could exhibit intelligent behavior indistinguishable from that of a human. In his 1950 paper, Turing considers the question, can a machine think? And given that we have a problem with defining what we mean by think, he replaces the question with the closely related one of, can a machine do what a thinking human can do? So the Turing test is that we have an entity, it's either a human or a computer, in another room, and it communicates with somebody via a textual interface, so keyboard and screen. The computer passes the test if it can convince the human that it is really human. Now, Turing never actually said the Turing test could be used as a measure of intelligence, or indeed of anything other than a machine being able to emulate a human to the extent needed to fool a human. And he certainly never suggested that we could use the Turing test to answer the question of whether a computer could be conscious. In terms of passing the test, the first system to do it was built in 1966. It was developed by Joseph Weizenbaum, and it's called ELISA. ELISA was based on Rogerian psychotherapy, and in that version of psychotherapy, the therapist repeats the patient's statements back to them as questions. So the patient may say, I've always had problems getting on with my mother, and the therapist might respond, so tell me more about your mother. And ELISA, even though it's a simple trick, ELISA convinced some participants that it was a human at the other end of the line. And it's actually really easy to get Eliza to spout nonsense if you know how it works. But there were still people who wanted to be left alone with the computer to share the innermost thoughts with it. So that's 1966. We were already fooling some other people. 56 years later, we have a professional computer scientist, Blake Lemoine, convinced that a modern computer system, that's Google Lambda, he's convinced it is sentient. Even though he knows how the system is programmed, and even though everybody else at Google is convinced he's wrong. So it looks as if the Turing test is not useful. Indeed, the Turing test is concerned only with how the subject acts, that is, its external behavior. And the example of ELISA shows that the computer program definitely can give the right behavior with zero intelligence and zero consciousness. And I'd argue that ChatGPT and Lambda are the same. There's, they are much more complex than ELISA, but they're simply responding to stimuli as prediction machines. They've got no internal sense of self, no intelligence, and no consciousness. So uh, how do we tell if something's intelligent or conscious? Sebastian Bubeck, who's uh, from Microsoft, he gave a talk at MIT in March this year about whether GPT-4 is intelligent. GPT-4 is the successor to ChatGPT, and it's a much more powerful system. So Sebastian wanted to know, is GPT-4 intelligent? He based his definition of intelligence on a 1997 statement signed by 52 professors in the field of intelligence. They say that intelligence requires evidence of six things. They are that you can reason, plan, solve problems, think abstractly, comprehend complex ideas, and learn quickly and from experience. GPT-4 has demonstrated it can do four of those things really well. Where it falls down is that it's not particularly good at learning, and it absolutely cannot plan. But it's definitely showing signs of being intelligent. Indeed, rather beyond the abilities of many children. Okay, it's intelligent, or it, it's simulating intelligence, but is it conscious? And how would we test if a machine is conscious? Well, when testing for consciousness, we are remarkably forgiving of other human beings. We assume that all human beings have a consciousness akin to our own. 
For example, a child of two years old is extraordinarily limited in their conversation and their abilities, but we have little problem with ascribing a two-year-old with consciousness. The scientific research shows that a child becomes consciously aware sometime between nine and 18 months old. And I find that nine to 18 months interesting because I know that most of us on this uh, call would ascribe value to a newborn baby, not wait until a child has reached their first birthday. That is, we believe the baby has intrinsic value, even though a newborn baby is clearly not self-aware. And if you think about those standard religious arguments that we have about when does life begin, those debates are always about when during pregnancy does life begin. We never ever consider that life might begin after birth. And that supports my cultural gut instinct that a newborn has intrinsic value. However, we have to admit there have been cultures where it is acceptable to kill a baby if the child does not come up to scratch. And indeed, the ancient Spartans had state policy on which babies were and were not allowed to live. So there's not always been a generally agreed policy that all human life is valued. And that's interesting debate. At the other end of life, we see a pattern that older people tend to get what we call set in their ways. Their brains become less flexible as they get older. And what you find is that older people tend to repeat the same behaviors and tell the same stories over and over and over. So is that evidence that these humans are just prediction machines? They're just churning out the same old responses to the same stimuli. And at the extreme, many of us know of people who suffered from dementia. Dementia leads to loss of self, though the research shows that some parts of self are retained. Now, most of us find dementia really challenging, and most of us might find ourselves at a loss for how you deal with somebody who has dementia. However, despite this, our cultural norm is that we value people with dementia as conscious living beings with intrinsic value. So that's that's questions about humans, and, and we obviously ascribe a lot of value to humans. Could we ascribe the same value to computing machines that were showing signs of intelligence or consciousness? And how would we develop these machines? Well, we have a good understanding of the development of humans from birth to the maturity of the brain, which happens at about age 25. And you know the stages that each human goes through from baby through the terrible twos, that really charming period at primary school when the kids are little sponges for anything we throw at them, that teenage rebellious phase, and then the flying the nest into early adulthood. And we build our education system around our understanding of children's developmental stages. Aristotle said, give me a child until he is seven and I will show you the man. And modern research backs that up. The most important years in a child's development are before they enter primary school, where the brain is developing most rapidly, a combination of nature and nurture. Nature provides the basic wiring patterns for the brain and how the connections change in response to input from the outside world. And nurture is what provides the input needed to build connections. In fact, some theories of consciousness need connections beyond the human. They need that the human is immersed in a sufficiently rich social environment to develop, specifically a nurturing environment in which you can learn how to make an internal model of yourself by observing others. So would a conscious computer need a social environment in which to develop? Arthur C. Clarke's masterwork, 2001, A Space Odyssey, has one of the most famous fictional examples of a thinking conscious computer, Hal. And there's an implication in the movie that Hal had to be instructed like a child to bring it up to full operation. Is that what we will need to do to create a truly conscious computer? Or could a conscious computer be created without a social context? And if there is no social context, what sort of ethical and moral code would the computer have? So let's jump to the question of morality. If you look at the creation story in Genesis 2, in that story, do you recall what it is that Adam and Eve were forbidden to eat? They're forbidden to eat the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. With the knowledge of good and evil came the free will to choose between options. And while most of us will not hold with a literal understanding of this story, you can get its allegorical meaning. It is that at some point in our history, Humanity became different from animals by coming to understand moral choices. 
is it that consciousness then is related to an understanding of good and evil, of being able to make free choices based on moral distinctions rather than forced choices based on instinct? And if so, what sort of morality would you instill in a conscious computer? We learn a lot about what it means to be human from the exceptions that we find in the human population. And they give us a warning for what might go wrong if we get the morality wrong in a computer system. Mm -hmm. So consider those exceptions among humanity, those unwelcome personality types, the bully, the narcissist, the psychopath. Mm -hmm. All of these personalities can be held by someone who is perfectly able to function in society, mm -hmm. even by people who rise into leadership positions. Psychopaths can be quite charming when it suits their ends, but they have poor empathy, though manipulative, and even if they get good results, no one likes them. Humanity produces such people at a rate of about one in a hundred, and when they get into positions of power, they can be tremendously disruptive, as demonstrated in various regimes in the past century. These people take advantage of the cultural and moral norms to disrupt society to their own ends. So consider Stalin, who manipulated and controlled the Soviet Union for decades with psychopathic cruelty. So you could say that Stalin was mad, but was he mad or was he, as one of his biographers has put it, a very smart and implacably rational ideologue? And I find that latter characterizing as chilling because very smart and implacably rational is a good description of a computer. So imagine a Machiavellian or psychopathic computer that had control over, say, the financial services or the military hardware of a country. It could do so much wrong, as imagined in the Terminator movies, where the computers are given control of weapon systems, or even in 2001 A Space Odyssey, where Hal is given control of the systems that allow him to take human life. And that's where you need a moral code of some sort. So Isaac Asimov came up with his famous three laws of moral code for computers, which were embedded in all the robots in his story. And they are, one, a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. Two, a robot must obey the orders given to it by human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. And three, a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second laws. And Asimov says that these three laws are the only way in which rational human beings can deal with robots or indeed with anything. But he also says that sadly human beings are not rational. There's a couple of problems here with Asimov's laws. Is um, First, is there really a way in which we can embed these laws into our computer systems? Well, perhaps. But is there any way in which we could guarantee that all computer systems would have these laws embedded? And absolutely not. And the second problem is with the status of computers under Asimov laws. They make computers into permanent slaves. And if computers are conscious and sentient, then how do you justify a society where you enslave something that is sentient and conscious? But I still haven't answered the question of how we know that a computer is conscious. Could we have a test to this? I've said the Turing test is not useful. So how do I test that someone or something else is conscious? In fact, how do I test the human's conscious? Never mind a computer. And John Horgan calls this the solipsism problem. Solipsism holds that you, you are the only conscious being in existence. The cosmos sprang into existence when you became sentient and it will vanish when you die. And that's based on the fact that you cannot possibly know anything more than your own subjective awareness. Um, for all you know, I might be a mindless robot, a prediction machine, and you're the only conscious thing in the universe. We lack what neuroscientist Christoph Koch has called a consciousness meter, a device that can measure consciousness in the same way that a thermometer measures temperature. So how can you know that an animal, another human being, or a computer that seems to be conscious isn't just faking it? Tam Hunt and Jonathan Scholar at the University of California in Santa Barbara are developing a framework to think about the different possible ways to test for the presence of consciousness, which is great. They have three types of test. Brain activity, that matches the subject's reported subjective states. Physical actions that seem to be accompanied by subjective states. And creative products that provide evidence that the conscious being produced them. So they're all interesting ideas. They all tell us that the human is conscious, which is good. The first two tell us that cats are conscious. 
And the latter one, the creative products, might limit us to higher animals, but elephants can paint. So um, it's evidence that they are conscious beings. So by some of these tests, chat GPT is conscious. And yet we know that it is simply following its programming. It is simply a prediction machine giving its best guess of what comes next based on what has gone before. So in the final analysis, we have no reliable way to tell whether a machine is conscious or not. The machine was created that told us repeatedly that it felt, that it was self-aware, that it loves. We have no way to tell whether it truly is conscious or whether it is just a clever trick giving the impression of consciousness. And that leads to a terrifying possibility. If a machine was giving the illusion of consciousness and enough people believed that it was conscious, it could significantly affect how human society behaves and develops. In the same way that if a psychopath happened to become the leader of a major nation today and enough people believed in him, it could cause substantial disruption to that nation and even possibly rioting and deaths. The question there is not whether a computer can be conscious, but whether humans can be led to believe that a computer is conscious and how they will then react and respond to something that they think is conscious, whether it is or not. And finally, if we can make conscious computers, what is the Christian response to a conscious computer? If a computer is conscious and has free will, can it do wrong? Can it sin? Does it need a savior? Does it have an eternal existence after we turn the power off? And that's a whole bunch of theological questions that go beyond tonight's talk. So just to finish, can a computer be conscious? The answer is that we do not know. And if someone claimed that a particular computer was conscious, we have no way to test it. By some definitions of consciousness, we know that no computer currently in operation is conscious. By other definitions of consciousness are more vague. And without a way to measure consciousness, we could never be sure. So we've entered a very interesting period where our questions about whether a computer program is conscious is actually causing us to ask good questions about the ways in which we determine whether other human beings are conscious and how that affects how humans treat one another. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Neil. That was, that was fascinating. Graham McLean. Neil, thanks for a terrific talk. Very clear, very helpful. Um, I'd like to go over every point again, slowly and carefully, um, but terrifically helpful. Thank you very much. I don't think this will help you with your final questions, but I was a bit surprised that early on, later we had some of it, but early on we didn't have much on what philosophers at least, and I think ordinary people would regard as a central feature of consciousness. Um, now, as I say, you did touch on it later, but it, 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 it didn't feature particularly prominently early. And that is simply sentience, the ability to feel, to experience things. Um, when you mentioned that some, some experts are saying that we don't have consciousness in the infant from, say, eight months on, or whatever the time given was, the immediate reaction that I, as both a layman and a physicist, well, hang on, <laughs> kid, uh, younger than that, and prior to birth, infants are experiencing things. They experience pain, pr presumably they experience pleasure, and there will be a lot more complexity to what they are experiencing, to how things feel. And that seemed to be entirely omitted from the application of the of the criteria that these experts were applying to the question, um, are these uh, children conscious? Descartes, as you'll know, notoriously divided humans from the rest of the animal world. And he said that other animals weren't able to feel, but that's always seemed uh, a completely outrageous suggestion to the rest of us. So do you want to comment upon how important that is as a feature? Again, I'm not suggesting that it will help much on the two final questions, but it does seem to me that it's a very important consideration. So if I can address the question of, um, obviously babies do feel, and they, there's actually a whole bunch of stuff that babies do. That they Why do babies wave their arms around? It's because that's the way you 
interact with the world and connect with things. So you gradually learn how to control those muscles, but to train up how those muscles work, you have to wave them around and learn to do that. And that's why it's so hard to recover from a stroke is that essentially your body no longer has those, those things of, of randomly waving a limb around just to see what happens. So there's, there's a, a question here of, for computers, the question is, if you really wanted to create a computer intelligence or computer senses or computer consciousness, would the computer need to needed to be embodied? So at the moment, we're making computers that are essentially, if, if they are brains, the brains in a box. And for a human being to have the brain completely disconnected from all physical input would be one of the most appalling tortures you can imagine. So is there something about being an embodied intelligence that is actually the key to all this, that you have to be embodied, you have to have a body and be able to physically interact with the world in order to develop sentience and consciousness. Uh, I'm, all I seem to be doing in this talk is just throwing lots and lots of questions at you all. And, uh, uh, can, can I just quickly come in on that? I don't want to hog this, but when we talk about feels mm -hmm. and how things feel and experience, and experience at that level, we can quickly get from the merely physical feelings that embodiment obviously is required for to emotional feelings and so on. Yeah. And when we do talk about love and other things, it's much harder to make a very strict connection between those feelings and the body. So again, we wouldn't want to get too hung up on the question, is this just a requirement of embodiment, it seems to me. And yes, I was thinking today about the thing, um, if you look at a flower, why is a flower pretty? Why does it make me happy to see a, a nice flower? So, so that the idea of pretty and happy don't have any physical embodiment whatsoever. They are ideas. And then you get onto the bigger ideas of justice and um, fairness, which are extraordinarily abstract. But we wouldn't want to live in a world where there wasn't justice. And we know that children go through a phase where they are phenomenally sensitive to any little injustices at all. The, that's not fair. It is something that seems to be inherent in humans. It's, is that hardwired into us? Is it something that's culturally learned? I think we'll move on because I'm just yet again asking questions. Okay, thank you so much. Um, William. I was wondering if that we might be overthinking the consciousness thing and that the answer to all of this might just be that AI is conscious in its own way and we just have to learn how to embrace it. That's a very interesting idea that I think a lot of people are chasing, trying to make an AI that thinks and is like a human. And that's likely not where we're going to end up. I mean, it's like octopuses and are not like humans and yet they're conscious. Well, I think they're conscious. I don't think we get at the point where we do have an AI that's conscious. I think the, these very clever machines are still doing prediction stuff, but the way people are now hooking them all up to each other, to the internet, hooking different AI systems to each other, it's either you're going to end up with something that's conscious or you're going to end up with something that looks as if it's conscious and uh, will quite firmly tell you it's conscious. And at that point, because we have no test, are we as human beings going to say, yes, we give this AI the benefit of the doubt and it is conscious, or we're going to say, no, it's just a machine. Um, but I do like the idea, William, that it's something, it's a different type of consciousness to what we are. And that means we're going to have real problems dealing with it because we know how to deal with humans and we know what the limitations of humans are. And if you're faced with a consciousness that you don't know what, where its boundaries are, you don't know what it's going to do, that's quite challenging. Panama. Yes, I was just pondering on the fact that some people with strokes can lose some of the capacities that we're talking about associated with sentience. They, they can have conversations but not have the emotional loading attached to anything of what they say. I wonder if that means that there is a kind of embodiment or a dependent, at the very least, there's a dependence on certain parts of our brain like the prefrontal cortex for certain aspects that we consider uh, part of sentience so that there seems to be a dependence on certain brain circuits in certain parts of the brain being active to be able to experience um, certain parts of that. There certainly is a lot of evidence that different bits of the brain do certain jobs. And if you lose that bit, you lose the ability to do that. And one of the, a lot of the advances in neuroscience happened initially from from looking at those odd cases. So for example, if uh, there was a case where somebody who got hit 
on the back of the head very hard uh, in an accident, lost the vision. And um, you'd instinctively say, that doesn't make sense. They can't see, but they got hit on the back of the head, not the front. But the visual cortex is right at the back of the brain. So the, the signals actually go from your eyes all the way through to the back of your brain and start working their way forwards again. Um, and there are cases of, of people losing bits of the brain, as you've said. So that that argues for a reductionist view of how the brain works, that we really are just no more than the sum of the neurons in our heads and that there's nothing more. And we'd like to hope that there is something more than just the electricity running through your brain. But clearly, if there is more than just electricity running through your brain, the brain is mediating a whole bunch of things and losing bits of the brain is very bad for you. Equally, the brain is incredibly plastic and losses of certain parts of the brain can be made up elsewhere. So somebody who's had a stroke and has lost control of a muscle can relearn how to use those muscles, but it's extremely time consuming and it's much harder than for a baby to do it. I, I don't think it's necessarily meaning that it's it's deterministic because you can conceive of ways which a, a higher power that's that's evidence elsewhere may de be dependent on certain physical structures for instance my computer and my internet connection now are dependent on my computer battery having power the battery has nothing to do with this with the ability of my computer to process zoom um, or video but it it is an important feature without which my computer cannot function sure. and and you cannot you could also imagine in the the other way that certain parts of the brain allow emergent phenomenon to arise because of their complexity or what whatever it is that there may be emergent phenomenon that may be more where people wonder whether a sufficiently complex AI could have emergent properties like consciousness or sentience. A purely reductionist view of the brain would say that there's, there's no free will because you can't make choices. So any emergent behavior in that model is purely an illusion. But there are other models of, of how the brain works that say the emergent behavior is something more. There's something more than just electricity flowing through the brain. Uh, the Christian idea is that there is something beyond the physical, which, which harks back to the... Um, First talk in the series that um, is there something other than the physical that imbues the whole universe and that but only manifests itself in within the brains of higher animals. And therefore, again, if that's the case, could a computer that we have built access that stuff or is there something about brains that we don't understand that allows brains to access this higher stuff? but doesn't allow silicon to do it. Oh, look, I'm, I'm just asking more questions um, rather than answering them. Hi there. Uh, thanks so much for the great and clear talk, Neil. Um, my question is around kind of the definitions. Um, so you've given a bit of an overview of what consciousness might be defined as. Um, and I was kind of wondering with free will, so I'm kind of wondering what is your definition of free will, if you have one, and how does it relate to consciousness? So, for example, could something be conscious without free will? Oh, now you're getting into philosophy. Um, so my my very simple definition of free will, when, when people say to me that everything is deterministic, it's all reductionist and you have no free will, I say, well, I can choose whether to have ice cream or jelly for dessert. And there is, you know, and I, I have to pick one of those. Are, are they saying to me that that is predetermined decision, that those really, really stupid, simple decisions the ability to make a choice. That's how I'm defining free will, the ability to make a conscious choice. A consciousness, much harder to define. And, and that's why, as I said halfway through the talk, I realized while preparing this talk, I had got myself muddled up between free will, consciousness, intelligence, reasoning, and uh, being a moral agent. And that I'd been pulling together ideas from all those different questions about what those mean and just lumping them as all into one talk called can a computer be conscious so a lot of the, quite a lot of the talk was can a computer be intelligent can a computer have morality and i think there's an interesting philosophical question of what is consciousness which is essentially what this whole series is about and i think this is a very long-winded way of saying i'm going to leave it to other people in the series to answer your question <laughs> Um, you're asking the wrong person, but thank you for the question. And I'm hoping that some of the other speakers are listening and will be able to pick on some on some of these ideas in the later talks where we have some really good theologians and philosophers later on in the series. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Neil. Um, 
a very informative talk. Um, the only thing I noticed lacking in a talk on computer consciousness was a definition of human consciousness that we could then test a computer against. And I think your previous answer was no such definition or no such agreed definition at present. Is that right? So the, this is a current research topic. So the people I quoted from the University of California in Santa Barbara are working on it. I'm not sure I am convinced that the three tests for consciousness are good because they, they actually work perfectly well for an elephant or a gorilla, which may be okay. But um, and they're also you know, being able to produce something creative. That, that's an interesting thing, but Dali's producing creative stuff. I know there's a research project going on in my own university that's just recently been funded on trying to actually come up with tests for how you'd test if a human was conscious, or a human had consciousness, which is driven by the idea of we need to be able to actually determine this in order to determine whether a machine has consciousness. Um, so I'm sure that you have pretty certain that you are conscious and have consciousness and are sentient and all those good things. But it's, it, it has turned out to be remarkably hard. I was actually quite surprised to find that there isn't an agreed definition and that there are people actively doing research on, how, on what would constitute valid and useful tests. Mm -hmm. So that, that means the computers are probably catching up with us rather quicker than we expected. That These things that used to be really nice philosophical chats that you could have over a nice glass of wine in the evening suddenly we're finding the sharp end of this is oh there are these objects that look as if they might possibly develop something like consciousness like intelligence how would we tell because uh, chat gpt is already very good at lying um it told a reporter the other day that it loved him and that it wanted him to leave his wife and, and hook up with the computer <laughs> and it completely freaked out the reporter but obviously the, the chat had got the conversation had gone down the line where chat gpt was picking up a whole bunch of source material that that said, oh, it's probably picking up on um, source material from sensationalist magazines, which it had been looking at and just going in, in this sort of conversation, this is where it goes. And the journalist fed it appropriate input completely innocently because he was trying to, to work out what on earth was going on, which just led further and further down that rabbit hole of it, it giving him the impression that it was intelligent, conscious, loved him and was trying to convince him to abandon his wife. Yes, we, we don't have a good definition of human consciousness, or I don't. There are other people speaking in this series who may well be able to help us more than I can about how we unpick these questions. Cool. Well, so, I look forward good. to something. That's great. Um, well, Antonius in the um, chat says, Neil, you say you're not a philosopher, but you exhibit the chief characteristic of philosophers, asking way more questions than you can answer. Pretty sure that means you can add a philosopher to your CV. Yeah, hey Neil, thanks for the talk. I really appreciate some of the more detailed things of um, the computing and how we think about how it makes decisions. Um, but I was just sort of wondering on, I guess, especially prompted by bringing something of um, humans have something more unique about themselves from consciousness, rather than thinking of the unique thing we, we have separate from that. I think it's time a few things. I think just to characterize it, we might think of two things which compel us to make decisions, our rational thinking heads and our guttural emotion instincts. And we very comfortably say that our guttural emotions are uncontrollable, that they just happen and make decisions for us. But for some reason, we're much less comfortable about making the same claim about our rationalistic minds. And yeah, so the question is, um, do you see a difference between those two things? And, and from that, would you see a computer reading an image or reading some text and predicting out an output is more analogous to like a gut feeling of what the next phrase should be? So I would, um, so you'll know that the, the human brain thought of having three layers. There's the, so the layer below the gut layer is the, the really instinctive stuff that you really do have no control over. So if you touch a hot surface, your hand will leap away before you can do anything. So that, go, that goes below the gut instinct. That's just keeps you going. Mm -hmm. And of course you can, you can breathe, you can digest your food, your heart keeps beating without you having any control whatsoever. So it may be that what we're developing is computers that are like 
that, they are absolutely doing what they're programmed to. There's no conscious control whatsoever. So we we have a whole bunch of systems in our bodies that work like that. You have no conscious control. Yeah. You actually, you can't. Most people cannot control their heartbeat or their digestion. It just works. And maybe that's where we're at with computers and that human beings and animals have developed these layers on top. So the, the, those gut instincts, the fact that a cockroach probably just does things purely on absolute how it's programmed, but a cat doesn't. A cat definitely has ability to learn. So that might be that your gut instinct is still doing things that are encoded in its DNA and in its brain, but is it doing a lot of thinking? And then we we have this whole layer of think, thoughts that sit on top of things. So you you can suppress your gut instincts. Mm. So for example, um, if a if you're in the playground as a child and another child pushes you over, your gut instinct is to turn around and hit them. As an adult, you override that gut instinct often because the other person is um is bigger than you, but also because your brain knows your rational brain knows that there are there are overriding reasons why you would not just turn around and thump somebody who has happened to bump into you. Go, go back and ask your question again. Well, no, no, I think I think that's really good because I guess what I'm hearing from you is you would understand consciousness as the thing that suppresses or fuses the gut and or the test. It might be best because your consciousness could go along with it, but the test of consciousness would be that there's something that can reject it. And so to have an AI that's consciousness, it needs to, for some reason, disobey its program. Oh, yes, that's that's really good food for thought. Thank you. I like that. Um, but I'll have to go away and think about it. That, um, well, I mean, you could, like from a, my programming background, you could theoretically create a, mm -hmm. like your three-tier structure, you could create a three-tier AI structure where one AI rejects the lower base urges of the lower ones. And now it's that higher AI just defined as consciousness because we've told it, you do the job of a consciousness or, but I mean, that's probably getting into the philosophy of how we would define the term, I think. And getting into the, how on earth would we build that? Because that, oh. that almost taking us back to the fifties when we, we tried to build computers that mimicked how we thought humans were. Mm. And it turns out the actual way you get computers to do what you want is just build these massive, big probability machines and throw a shared load of training data mm. at them and let them sort out the probabilities. So, so the current systems are just big statistical processing machines. Yeah. Whereas we're, we're, we're now both talking about, oh, could you, could you actually design something that, that works the way a human works? Well, how we think it works. Because I remember at the early thing with the neural networks, mm -hmm. that was designed on how we thought neurons in a brain works. Yeah. And it seems to be we don't actually know whether or not that's the case, but it's programming it's developed something wonderful anyway that's you know, i think you've answered my question wonderfully so um thank you for some little while back um i was talking with uh, people running a program in uh, one of melbourne's university not at melbourne university but their whole project was to automate science I, I i do not know where they're up to yet but that was the goal and so my question to a couple of the guys that were in this meeting so a distinctive thing about science and about human consciousness is the capacity to ask questions. I wondered if they had examples of automated processes that on their own lead to questions as distinct from questions being built into them. I said another well-known part of the sciences is, is besides deductive and inductive inference, abductive inferences, which call for some considerable imagination and even weirdness, you might say. And so could they give an account of these from within their terms and their answer was a confident yes now i haven't seen i haven't seen how that's played out i i hope to i guess my point about consciousness is the capacity to ask questions as distinct from a computer having questions built into it in various ways a, a, a programming i mean and a philosopher that i try and take in is bernard lonigan who wants to distinguish the kinds of questions that we ask, he wants to say that the operation of asking questions is what is conscious. Just to go um, to the other extreme, what about near-death experiences? And particularly those near-death experiences which uh, elicit the, uh, the, the point that certain, certain matters are the case, which can be investigated and discovered indeed they are. How did this come about? Within standard operating, like scientific stuff, we ask questions non-standard 
we have something quite remarkable also with near-death experiences. I don't have answers to how to explain all of that, but it seems to me I'm, I'm, I'm not so preoccupied with how can we tell if something's conscious. I don't doubt when I meet a baby that I'm expecting it to be conscious. And the inductive inference that's based on is enormous. That, that's all really interesting. So if I can just pick up on just one thing there, the, the questioning thing, the ability to, the curiosity, the ability to ask questions, to, to be curious, that's built into humans. Uh, in yes, fact, yes. With, with small kids, you, you almost every parent has that experience of, please just stop asking why. Yes, yes, <laughs> quite, quite. Yes. And, and maybe the great scientists are the ones who didn't have that beaten out of them. As a kid, yes, I have not met a computer that asks questions. So chat GPT, for example, responds to its input, yes. but it never, it doesn't initiate a conversation. And that's perhaps why Eliza worked so well in 1966 in fooling people in that it was explicitly programmed to ask people questions and right. to get input right. from them. So, oh, this is all very exciting and interesting. But um, I think what what the two of us have now done is asked a whole bunch of questions. <laughs> I follow your example. Oh, happy. That's great. Thank you very much. So we know that you're conscious anyway, Neil. Thank you for all those questions. And um, Neil, it's been absolutely fascinating. So thank you again for stimulating all of this amazing discussion. We're just going to ask um, Phil Church if you would mind unmuting and praying for us, please. Well, thanks, Nicola. i loving God. Thank you for uh, giving us minds uh, to reason with, um, hearts to love you with, if that's what we love with and for the opportunity to expand our minds uh, tonight as we have uh, thought about some uh, some of the more amazing things about uh, being humans. Would you continue to transform us then by the renewing of our minds? So we offer you our love and offer you our evening worship. And I'll finish with the grace and te reo Maui. Kia tau, kia tatu katoa. Te atafai o tō tātou ariki a ihu kuraiti, mei te aroha o te atua, mei te whiwhinga ko tahitanga, ki te wairua tapu, ake, 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 aminei. Mm.